Hi, this is Dave Fisher, Extension Dairy Educator here at the University of Illinois. Today we're going to be visiting about alfalfa production. At the end of this training module, you'll be able to better understand and manage the legumes for improved yields and stand longevity. Also, there's a lot of information that we need to understand about soil fertility, soil testing, so that you can evaluate the impact of soil fertility on your alfalfa growth and yield. And then finally, hopefully you'll be able to understand as we talk about describing how harvest management can impact the quality and quantity of your forage crop. We can begin by first discussing the selection of your legume variety. And there's no doubt, there's various types of uh, alfalfas and clovers out there from various types of uh, seed companies. I would suggest that you want to get a good seed rep that uh, you can rely on and you're very familiar with their type of seeds. I suggest that, number one, we have to talk about high-yielding legume alfalfa clover varieties. For alfalfa, in uh, my part of the world, in central southern Illinois, we are looking at about a six tons of dry matter per acre being high-yielding. Forage quality, of course, falls right next. As I look at forage varieties, I want to make sure that I've got varieties that are going to be high protein, high digestibility, so that I can get a RFQ or relative forage quality of at least 150 or higher. I do grant, though, that forage quality probably can be dictated more with your management of the harvest than it can by variety. You still need to look at it on the variety. And then let's take a look at winter hardiness. And again, I know we've got uh, students from all over the U.S. And, and further. And so based on your locale and the freeze and thaw situations, winter hardiness may or may not be a issue. But in the Midwest, certainly you want to make sure that uh, you've got a, a good winter hardy variety disease and pest resistant, and we'll talk more about that, but I'm talking about some of our root rot, the, some of our leaf blotch type uh, diseases that we need to be sure that these varieties are resistant to. And then lastly, we'll talk more about the stand life expectancy and by doing some plant counts and some stem counts. But we want to suggest your varieties need to be at least a three to four year stand for your alfalfa and probably at least two years for red clover. Another tool that is out there for all of us to use in selecting legume varieties is a tool called Milk 2013. This is a uh, spreadsheet that was developed at University of Wisconsin-Madison, and uh, a lot of the researchers and extension folks up there use this and promote this tool to be used for alfalfa and grasses, and actually it combines the yield and quality into a single index, and so later on we'll be visit about the milk per acre or milk per ton. Then another question comes out is, what type of uh, variety do I want a pure seed variety or do I want a blend of two or three alfalfa varieties? There's also some work out there on hybrid varieties. And so, again, look at your university research test plot or your industry test plot data and make sure you've got some good information that is two or three years of uh, data use so that it's not just putting all your eggs in, a, in the basket on a new variety. Make sure, though, you've got those things reviewed. And lastly, we will talk about low lignin alfalfa. The value of reduced lignin in alfalfa really comes to improve forage quality. And along with that, and this is some work done by Dr. David Combs from University of Wisconsin-Madison. Dr. Combs also suggests that now we have a wider harvest window and also, you're going to be able to take a later harvest, which may mean greater tonnage per cutting. Again, you can make use of that full growing season. And again, the bottom line, we're suggesting that if we have lower lignin alfalfa, we can go longer between harvest and not compromise the quality. When we look at the uh, information on leafhopper resistant varieties, we're talking about plants that have bred into them small hairs on the stems that actually deter that little wedge-shaped flying insect from piercing and feeding uh, off of the plant. Potato leafhopper resistant varieties are recommended in areas that you have a lot of intense pressure from this insect. The thing that I would suggest, though, that even though you would have a leafhopper resistant variety, you still need to make sure that you scout and be willing to spray because the variety will work on moderate to medium pressure. But if you get some intense pressure, you will still have to spray. So we do talk about that the threshold is about three times that of the non-leafhopper variety, but yet it still will be an issue that you will have to spray. 
Earlier, we talked about or used the term longevity, and that comes now to the point where we want to talk about in your alfalfa production program, you need to take time every spring of the year to scout the fields and even do a a count. And I'm suggesting we're doing a stem count to determine yield potential. And is it a stand that will keep another year or is it time to plow it up or to rework it and put something else out there? I suggest here again that we want to talk about stem count versus plant count. Some of the uh, information talks about so many plants per square foot, but I want to talk about stems per square foot. And so you can see the chart there. If it's greater than 55 stems and you count, actually count the stems, you're going to be maximizing your yield. That's, that's the best you're going to be able to get out there in that second, third, fourth year. And that would be awesome to have that good of a stand. If you start to get down to 40 to 54, you're going to start to see some yield loss, but probably still can can make it another year. But if you get out there and find you had some winter kill or some diseases took over, or some insects took over and really reduced your stand, and now you have less than 40 stems per square foot, it's time to replace the stand. So again, I just want to caution you that you're going to make this count in the spring of the year when your plant's about four to six inches tall so you can actually see what stems are actually viable and growing. We need to spend a little time and yet talk about the fertility. I mentioned earlier how important it is to have your soil tested. And we talk about that over and over again in all crops. Alfalfa is the same. Every three to four years, you want to establish your soil profile to know where your pH level is. And so at the time that you want to now seed your alfalfa, you want to bring your soil pH up to 6.7 to 7.2 because that's the optimum for growing alfalfa. And I'm suggesting that you want to bring it up to 7, 7 7.1, 7.2 at the beginning of your first seeding year so that after four years, you still are in that 6.7 range. And also, we want to make sure that we are optimum phosphorus and potassium in the soil, and that's for maintenance If it's not at that level, and I suggest 50 P2O5 level and about 300 K2O level in my soil test for maintenance. And if it's not there, we should then now add some commercial fertilizers or manure to bring it up to that point. Seeding rate. Interesting question on seeding rate. I get that a lot. The people say, how many pounds? Of course, we're buying it per pound. And so therefore, the less pounds, the less number it's going to cost. However, we want to suggest based on the research and the plot data, 15 pounds of alfalfa seed per acre. If you're going red clover, you'll probably get by with 12. And this is for pure legume seeding. It does not include a, a grass seeding. And we'll talk a little bit more about the reason we want to take a look at the seeding rate based on seeds versus versus actual weight. I want to point out, and we'll look at this in another module on economics, but the annual fertility needs is about 15 pounds of phosphorus and about 60 pounds of potash, actual phosphorus and actual potash per ton of alfalfa removed. And again, depends on your soil productivity, your organic matter, your soil type, boron and sulfur are both to be added. We have mentioned several times about the leaf hopper, but we've not talked yet about alfalfa weevil. In our part of the country, in southern Midwest, alfalfa weevil tends to be a problem on the first cutting. And so again, you have to be ready to scout and spray for that as well as summer weeds. A quick comment again on the alfalfa seeding rate, and we want to discuss that depends on the seed coating. And all of your alfalfa seeds will have a seed coat. But if you have a light seed coat, 15 pounds per acre is where we're going to be. If it's a heavier seed coat because of uh, maybe some protected limestone on it or whatever, you may have to get up to 20 pounds or so per acre. The goal would be to have about 80 seeds per square foot. And so alfalfa would have about 250,000 seeds per pound. And if we do the math on that, uh, if we do 15 pounds times 250,000 divided by 43,560 square feet in an acre, we come up with about 86 seeds per square foot. So that's the goal there, that 80 seeds per square foot. Seeding date, again, uh, it can vary depending on where you are in the country, but um, the rule of thumb would be that you want, if you do a fall seeding, you want to uh, seed it at least 45 days before the first killing frost so it has time to get established and, and uh growing before the frost comes in and puts it dormant. But if you go to the spring seeding, usually we say the earlier the better. April 1 to May 15th fits pretty well. After May 15th, it gets pretty dry, pretty warm, and pretty hard to get our alfalfa seeding established. Pure stand versus mix merely says is that all alfalfas are the grass mix, and there are some discussions we can have about that later as well. 
The last part I want to comment on, and a lot of people don't think about it, but that is the autotoxicity effect of alfalfa. And that is the ability of the alfalfa currently, the older plants, to produce a toxin that will kill off new seedlings. And so when we talk about autotoxicity in alfalfa, we're suggesting you cannot go in there after the second and third year and try to thicken up the stand by seeding more alfalfa because the old alfalfa plants will produce that toxin. And if their plant is within six inches or even even 16 inches, it will have a reduction or it will just merely die off. And so therefore, it's going to be impossible to thicken up a stand of alfalfa by reseeding more alfalfa. Now, some people suggest that after that third year, if you want to keep it one more year, you can maybe seed some grass in, or some people even do uh, maybe a little clover in there. That's okay because it's not the alfalfa on alfalfa. So keep that in mind. The final comment uh, before we end this module will be we have to really understand how harvest and maturity of the plant has an effect on quality and quantity. And so I have uh, suggest that we really need to still work with what's called the PEAQ program. That's Predictive Evaluation for Alfalfa Quality. It is an in-field observation where you measure the plant, you record that plant height, you identify as a late vegetative or as a bud stage or now flower, and then you can determine what the uh, predicted relative feed value will be in the field. Now, again, this is relative feed value. That's a bit different than the relative forage quality. The relative feed value merely takes in the ADF and NDF portion. So the bottom line, we suggest that when that PEAQ, and there are charts out there to view it, reaches 170 relative feed value, it's time to bring out the hay bind and start to harvest because it's going to lose about uh, 20 points, 15 to 20 points in respiration, leaf loss, those type of harvest losses. And by the time you get it to the barn or to the cow, it'll probably be 150 relative feed value, which is still a very high quality feed. If you delay that harvest, some of the past work that I've done in other universities show that you could lose three to five points per day on relative feed value by delaying it. So again, we have to remember that the forage quality will certainly be dependent on when we take that, that cutting. So once we take that first cutting and we harvest in the bud stage at 170 relative feed value in the field, we now establish that every second, third, fourth cutting will be taken 25, 28, 30 days. Again, depends on the weather conditions and the, and the moisture. But we now we have a, a marked date that we can look for to take the next successive harvest. That last harvest needs to be done no less than 35 days prior to dormancy because, again, we don't want the plant to be depleted of all the root nutrients and then go dormant. So we'll take the plant off, allow it to replenish its root nutrients, and then be able to go dormant. And so certainly some producers still want to take a harvest after dormancy on selected fields, and that is possible, especially if you have a year where you have low yields and therefore needing extra hay. But keep in mind that whenever you take a dormant harvest, there could be a chance to stress that plant or that field for the next, next, next year. And certainly, last but not least, you want to minimize your harvest and storage losses. And so make sure that your equipment is in good shape, working working very well. So then to summarize or to sum things up for this module, basically, I think we need to remember always that high-quality forages are a must for our lactating dairy herds. I mean, no doubt about it. And so if we want high-quality forages and high quantity, we got to make sure that we replenish the fertility needs that's removed by that crop. Make sure that the insects and disease are not reducing our stem population or our plant population. And then again, too, make sure that we take that first cutting at the bud stage in the field when it's about 170 PEAQ. Thanks, and hope this will help you with your next production year.